not a lot. He's challenging himself to worship with uh, two African congregations today, one after the other. And uh, so he thought, uh, so he's there this morning, and he'll be here tonight for the evening service. I want to begin by reading some verses from Psalm 95. <clears throat> says, Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is a great God, the great King above all gods. Come, let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God. We are his people of his pasture, the flock of his care. Let's pray. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for your abiding presence. Thank you for each one that's here. We pray for those that couldn't be here this morning. We pray that you would encourage each one of us. Help us always to be mindful that you're with us. We pray for Pastor Bruce as he uh, is away. We pray that you would bless the work, the ministry that he is presenting today, the word. We pray that you would continue to encourage each one of us through your word and through the psalms. And we thank you for all things. For in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Sister Bonnie is here today to lead us in worship, and we're glad that she's here. Thank you. Thank you, brother. And it is good to be here. We're going to start right off this morning with an object lesson, and I know that I've showed this um, guide to you before. We often use this in children's ministry, object lessons, but I find as an adult, when a preacher uses an object lesson, I remember the object lesson. So I think it's good for adults too. So here's this, uh, this uh, van that uh, my husband, Pastor Gary, he made, and he's got nice blue paint mixture. But there's a problem. He's got a big hole in him. And that's the way God made all of us. He made us with a place that only he can fill. And um, we can try and fill it, this place, with lots of different things, like modern technology, which is really modern technology. Or we could um, try and fill this place with a nice car, which is an expensive car. And it, uh, you know, you keep it shined up and you pay a lot of money for it and you pay for repairs and, and this becomes a thing that, that's going to try and fill this place in your heart, but it won't fit very well. Or maybe, uh, maybe you'd like to just make lots of money. Um, this is not real, by the way. But there is uh, 50, it's a hundred, there's a hundred dollar bill and um, Maybe you think that if you had lots of money, it would it would fill that place in your heart that God has made for only Him, but it won't work. Or maybe you'll fill your life with sports. This is a golf ball, but it could be a soccer ball, or basketball, or a, pop, a hockey puck, and you fill your life with sports, but it doesn't quite fit either. There's only one. There's only one that can fill that place. And here we have only Jesus can fill that place in our heart that is made just for him. And then when we put him first, he can help us to enjoy um, all of these other things in their right perspective. But Jesus needs to be first. He's the only one who can truly fill that place in our heart that's made for just him.
by Richard Rivers in 1910. And in 1911, a big fire took his wife, his three boys, and his in-laws, his wife's parents. They all perished in the fire one year later after he wrote his song. The interesting thing is that um, a lot of people will say that he wrote the song because these things happened, but actually what happened is the Lord gave him this song before. And I find that often God will prepare us beforehand for things that are coming in our life that we're not aware of. And so when you sing this hymn this morning, think about what a gracious God to bring this song to uh, Luther and prepare his heart. Because I'm sure after these bad little things happened, he would sing this song. And the truth of them would be more real than ever.
she loved me to have another wife, and then I lost her seven years ago, and now he's given me the pleasure of having a third wife. And I hope it's the last one, because I don't know why, but uh, we never know where God's going to take us, or how he's going to lead us, and how he's going to encourage us by different people that come into our lives. And if I hadn't married Donna, I wouldn't have met any of you. <laughs> so God is great. He is good to us all the time. Amen. So a couple of announcements. I Okay, yeah, this is the right page. <laughs> I asked Bruce to send me what he would like me to announce, so he sent it to me last night. He says, uh, have the people remember to pray for Bonnie as she uh, is going to the retirement home this afternoon at 1.30 and minister there. And we know they really appreciate her as uh, she ministers to them. And also be mindful of the service this evening at 6.30 when uh, Pastor Bruce will be back and presenting what's on his heart tonight. And uh, it'll be downstairs, and he wants you to come in the back door. And then uh, we'll have to remember Pastor's wife, Patricia. She'll be going for surgery on Tuesday. It's uh, they did their preliminary uh, stuff all on Friday, and so her surgery is a go ahead. So far, so good, and we can pray that it will go forward because I know she's been waiting quite a while. And so he won't be in the office until next Friday because uh, he has to look after her when she gets home. And uh, she's supposed to be staying in until at least one night overnight. And if everything's going well, then she'll be coming home on Wednesday. <clears throat> so don't forget to pray for her. And then uh, on the November 1st, there's going to be a movie night here downstairs, and it's going to be the movie Tortured for Christ. The Pastor Richard Warmbrand story, and uh, I know it's a good movie. I've heard about it, so uh, it's looking forward to presenting that on November 1st downstairs. And then our, the anniversary service is coming up on November 8th. And it'll be at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And uh, people need to sign up because we're limited to how many spaces we can have. We're going to have the service first, and then there'll be a dinner downstairs. So you have to sign up for both. And uh, they'll uh, take first come, first serve. And uh, he also said that our journey's call has... Uh, are coming and they're going to present some special music during that service. And uh, I know they're a good, good group. We've heard them a number of times at Sydney Camp and they really have a heart for the Lord and as they sing with their ministry. So those are the announcements and I hope you uh, continue to remember them as we move forward. I know we all have needs, we all have concerns, and uh, there's many. So as we pray, I pray that you would also be mindful of them. And I'm going to ask uh, <coughs> Lassa, my brother down here, <laughs> Gavin. I knew it was Evan, but I couldn't think of the first part. <laughs> brother Gavin, I wonder if you could have a prayer for us this morning, please. Heavenly Father, we, we are so thankful to gather here this morning to worship together as your family. And Father, you have heard these requests for prayer. We pray, Lord, that you would surround these folks with your presence, that your presence would be known. We ask your protection around each and every one. We thank you for the many blessings that you have bestowed upon this church congregation, Lord, and churches throughout the world. We pray for our brothers and sisters in other countries, especially those who are under your wrath, Lord. We ask for protection. We ask that you would anoint those who are speaking the truth with courage and the knowledge that you are with them. We 
She will keep them no matter how difficult the time that they may go through. We thank you, Lord, that even in the country that we do, where we are allowed to gather and worship, we thank you for your presence in our lives. Father, bless our service today. Bless each and every one of us that's here. And we think of those who are not here, Lord. We know that you will continue to protect them, bless them in your life. And we thank you for all you are.
not likely the love that most people talk about in this world. But God's love is what they call agape love. It's the very nature of God. And this love has an action, and we can choose whether we want to accept it or reject it. It was God's agape love that brought Jesus Christ to earth to be our sacrifice. And in reading the Bible, we see that uh, 1 John speaks more about this agape love than any other book. And there are two main ideas that are presented in 1 John. The first is we can't love God without loving brothers, our brothers and sisters. We can't love God unless we love our brothers and sisters. And we cannot love God if we don't obey him. And it's impossible to have love for when we ignore what we say, how can we truly love? The other part, or another part of God's love is God's wrath. And a lot of us don't want to think about that part. And someone wrote what wrath is often translated as fierce anger, indignation, vengeance, or punishment. A longer definition of the word wrath is the emotional response to perceived wrong and injustice. Although both humans and God have the capacity of expressing wrath, there are many differences between the wrath of God and the wrath of man. God's wrath is displayed in both the Old and New Testament, and it's always holy and always justified. Man's wrath, however, is rarely justified, justified and is never holy. And it's hard. Sometimes for us, when people do things against us, to keep our wrath, our anger in check. But we have to remember who we are. But what we need to understand is the wrath of a just, pure, holy God is dreadful to evildoers. And we, but we have to remember also that the Bible tells us that God is slow to anger, <coughs> eager to forgive, and so should we be. But I know it's hard because I know my own nature. I know God's been working on me. Years ago, I used to jump quick at people. Now, not so much. I've realized it doesn't help. The wrath of God is, less, is mentioned less in the New Testament than the Old Testament. However, it's no less terrible to fall under God's wrath. And God's wrath abides on whoever rejects the Son. Whoever rejects the Son. Many believe that God's wrath was more the Old Testament God. However, <clears throat> we have to remember one thing. God doesn't change. God was the same yesterday, today, and forever. So his wrath, yeah, it was in the Old Testament, but it's in the New, and he's still going to bring wrath. So God is still a God of wrath. And our question is, why does God have wrath? Why? He 
has it because God hates sin. He hates evil. And this sin and this evil brings God's wrath upon individual people as well as nations. And some examples of God's wrath in the Old Testament are in Leviticus 10, 1 and 2, we read of his wrath against two individuals, the two sons of Aaron. They were supposed to be priests to God, the one and only God. They had rules to follow. But when we read it, we find out that they didn't do what they were supposed to. They were doing evil things. And what happened is God killed those two men. He brought down fire and consumed them, killed them, right in front of his altar, because they were doing things that he had not commanded. Disobedience is what killed them. And it was a warning to all. Disobedience means death. When we look at the children of Israel, all the way through, once they came out of Egypt, even though they saw all the miracles of God, even in the desert with Moses leading them and God leading them, every once in a while they rebelled and God put consequences. Some died. When we read once they've gone into the promised land, in the book of Judges, why do we have the book of Judges? The judges came to save the people of Israel because when they didn't have them, they started to do their own thing, go against God, didn't do what he wanted. And then God's wrath came and he used other nations to attack them. Happened through judges. It happened through the kings. When we read about the kings, you'd have a good one. The nation would prosper and do well. They'd have a bad one. Things would go wrong. God's wrath would fall on them. And eventually, what happened? He brought an other nation, and you wonder why God would use an evil nation to take away his loved nation. But because they were doing evil, God doesn't like evil, doesn't want us to sin. Many of us have read the book of Jonah, and all the time we're focusing on Jonah and what he did. But there's something there that we sometimes overlook. That city of Nineveh. Jonah was told to go there because they were so evil and tell them that God was going to destroy them if they didn't repent. Jonah was reluctant to go. We know the story. He was going the other way, got thrown over into the sea, big fish swallowed him for three days and then spit him out. And then Jonah reluctantly went and did preach to that city. And what happened? Those city repented. What did Jonah do? He went and sat on a hill, was waiting for God to destroy that city. He was waiting for God to destroy. But when God didn't do it, this is what Jonah said. He said, I knew you were a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. He understood why God didn't do to Nineveh like he was going to? Because the people repented. That's the key. To get away from God's wrath, we need to repent. God is always concerned about people. He's always concerned and wanting people to repent. In the New Testament, we read verses like John 3, 16, which was already quoted this morning. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have 
small number of lives to be minded. God doesn't want any to perish. He doesn't want any to miss out. He wants all to come to repentance. That's why he's patient. But he did give us a free will to choose. We can choose. In Romans chapter 1, I want to read verses 18 to 25. It says, The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all godlessness, wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. For though they knew God, they neither glorified him as God or gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools, and exclaimed the Change the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man, birds, and animals, and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of the heart to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the created things rather than the Creator, who is forever to be praised. Amen. When you read that in scripture and you think of our world today, you wonder what's changed. Nothing's changed. People don't want to hear the truth about God. People don't want to hear about the fact of God's wrath. And God's wrath includes the fact and the truth of hell. People don't want to hear about it. We have to realize that God's wrath is expressed and demonstrated in hell. And no one should desire to go there. And however, many people of all ages have joked about it. We believe there's no such thing, or no such place, or no one will really experience it. But what we as believers need to be remember that hell is a real place. And God made it a place for the devil and his angels. Because it says in Matthew 41, Then he shall say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed into eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. The devil and his angels are not physical beings, they're spiritual. Therefore, hell is eternal separation from God. And many people do not have a correct view of hell. They do not have a correct view of God's wrath. I've heard people say, and you probably have too, say, I'm going to hell. I want to go to hell because that's where all my friends are. But we have to remember how it's described as utter darkness. When you're in a room that's completely dark, you can't see your hand in front of your face. Hell is also a continuous fire, a place of torment. They have to remember that hell, when you're there, you're by yourself. You don't see anybody. It's not a place that any of us want to be. Many people don't want to think of God's wrath. They only want to think of God's love. Those who believe God is a God of wrath as well as a God of love, prefer to think of his wrath just in the Old Testament. And they think because Christ came, we're now safe to think only of God's love. 
God still has love because he had so much love he sent his son. But God still has wrath because he can't stand sin and evil. And the only way we are covered is when we accept Christ. If we believe that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, then why would God not be a God of wrath as well as a God of love? For some reason, many people have the wrong view about God's wrath. They have this false view that God's going to allow everyone into heaven. Other people believe they, that there's more than one way to get to heaven. My Bible tells me the only way is through Jesus Christ. So how can someone read the word of God and say there's more than one way? The world believes in Satan's lie. He says if you do more good than bad, you've made it. My Bible doesn't talk about that. It says one way. One way, that's through Jesus Christ. And most of us have heard ministers lie at funerals. You know, been to funerals. You want to get up and tell them he's lying. We know the person that's died didn't know Christ, and yet they say he's in heaven. It's impossible. According to God's word, <coughs> It's impossible. And it's amazing to me when someone dies suddenly how great a person they were. You know, it seems like anyone who died suddenly was the greatest person on earth. They're only good enough for heaven if they knew Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. God's wrath is real. And we can avoid it by only one way. As the word of God says in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whosoever, that each one of us, believeth on him, should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands already condemned, because he has not believed on the name of God's one and only Son. Choices to be made. Romans 5, 9 says, Since we have been made new, being justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? We are justified through Jesus Christ's blood that he shed. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, so that no one can boast. That throws that idea of good works, bad works, right out the window. Only through faith. when things don't go the way we thought. 
Son are subject to the wrath of God, meaning they'll never truly enjoy peace. They'll never have the peace of God within or be ever in the presence of God. The question is not, why would a loving God send anyone to hell? But the question is, why would anyone choose hell over a loving God? The choice is ours. The choice is always ours. We have free choice. Freedom to believe God and His Word. The truth is here. Or would you believe Satan and what he's telling you is a lie? Choose you this day. Joshua said it to his people. Choose you this day who you will serve. Choose today. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for your word. We pray that as it's been spoken, that you would bring it to mind to us in all ways. Help us always to live for you, so we not fall under your wrath. Thank you, Lord, for all things. Amen.